Fine, fine. And the final, the way this will probably final come out is we'll probably tease out, you know, uh, like two minute to five minute clip. Um, yeah. And it'll, that'll probably be a montage of things. Depending sure. On what, uh, where it is. Yeah, where right, the right. Conversation goes. But we'll, what we'll do is we'll sure. make a transcript of the entire conversation. Yeah, right. And then we'll edit that and we'll put that up in its entirety so that people can see. Oh, that'll be great, yeah. You know, the entire history, everything that goes on. Yeah, so yeah, right, right. We'll talk about it, we'll have a, a record of it. And I think that'll be one of those things that we'll probably use this in a lot of different ways over the next year. Great, um, great, great, we'll yeah. We'll always you know, send you stuff for approval before we put it up. Then sure, we'll sure. We'll have you, if you want to be involved in the editing process, we'll do a transcript. And no, no, no. I got, I got confidence in you guys. Okay. <laughs> no, um, that's right. So, and, and what we'll do is, uh, you are the first president that we're interviewing, and so we'll probably have some, some hit miss on this. Sure, but sure, think, yeah. Uh, some of the things that just, some of it will just be the fundamentals. I'd love to get you saying, introducing yourself, yeah. Um, when you became a member, right? You know, when you uh, became president, uh, the works that you know, the books that you published, uh, and uh, as you said, the how you became involved in Penn. Yeah, yeah, um, fine, fine. Then you know, we can do some of the more introductory stuff, either at the beginning or at the end. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, right. Right. Okay. Fine, but fine. why don't we why don't we start off with uh, joining Penn? Yeah. Fine. So, fine. Uh, I'd love to hear about why you joined Penn. Yes. Um, what circumstances brought you to Penn and, and what you originally sought from the organization? Right, the right, time. yes, yes. The, the reason I joined Penn uh, was really uh, quite simple. Uh, I uh, had been censored. Uh, my first novel, on which I had worked for, like most first novelists, uh, three or four or five years, uh, was bought by a prominent uh, New York publisher, Farrah Strauss and Giroux, uh, Farrah Strauss and Cudahy, they were called at that time. And, uh, and, and uh, Bob Giroux, who was the editor, said it was the best first novel he'd read in 20 years. So I was walking on air. Uh, but they circulated it to the three partners. And Sheila Cudahy was a very devout Catholic. And when she read it, she said, if you publish this novel, I am going to take all my money out of the company. And uh, uh, the other two gentlemen did not have that much money, apparently. And anyway, uh, they decided uh, they would just cancel the book. And they sent uh, the book back to me. I was allowed to keep the small advance. And, uh, uh, and, and that was, to put it mildly, a devastating experience. I had no real comeback except to try to sell it elsewhere. But these were the days of uh, Cardinal Spellman. And anyone who was uh, accused of attacking the Catholic Church was a very dubious bet to get anything published. And uh, uh, that was the, in the era, perhaps, just to fill in for, for some listeners. Uh, uh, Cardinal Spellman uh, took a great dislike, the same year, more or less, that, he tur that my novel got turned down. He took a great dislike to the film Baby Doll, which was running in Times Square with a gigantic illustration. And uh, it looked like it was going to be one of the big hits of the year. And, uh, Within one week of Cardinal Spellman's denunciation, that film was withdrawn from two-thirds of the theaters in the country. So he had power, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in, in this area. And so I could not get the book published again uh, uh, anywhere. Uh, and I, in fact, it took 14 years uh, and uh, several rewrites uh, to get the book published. Uh, in in 1970, in, let's see, uh, well, 14 years, in, in the 80s sometime, and uh, uh, it was reviewed as a historical novel <laughs> about the Catholic Church and sold 3,000 copies. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can see why I have, a, I have and have always had a very, very deep hostility to censorship. And it wasn't, I, I should add, it's not just that experience. Uh, uh, I, I, would, I was, a, I was a, a, a dangerous character right from the start. When I was editor of, the, of my uh, uh, st student magazine at Fordham, uh, we were required to study scholastic philosophy. Well, I had thought it was a bore and we preferred to study other philosophies and so forth. And, uh, and, and, but there was a, a form that the, that the uh, those Catholic colleges taught at that time. Uh, it, it, it played uh, uh, big on the word method. You know, you had to learn to think in this method and so forth. Well, I got one of my best friends who was of the same attitude that I, I had uh, to 
uh, to write an article. And we waited for the, for the Jesuit, who was the mentor of the magazine. It was the last issue of my senior year. When we, we waited for him to, uh, uh, to, to, go, to go to bed for the night, he left us there. We would just say, oh, we'll just put one or more, two, little more, a touch here, a touch there, Father. And we immediately ripped out one article and we put in his, <laughs> and it was called Discord and Method. <laughs> and it was an all-out attack on scholastic philosophy. <laughs> and when it came out, I was summoned to the, uh, president's office. Uh, he was a very well, a famous Jesuit at that time, Robert I. Gannon, one of the most sought after dinner party, di after dinner speakers in the country, you know. And he looked at me and he said, Do you realize that this magazine is published, is, is, uh, is sent to Rome? <laughs> and I said, I had no idea, Father. <laughs> and uh, I thought maybe I wasn't going to graduate, but uh, he calmed down. He, he was a pretty sophisticated guy, like many Jesuits, you know, and he knew it would look very, very bad. So uh, he just ber berated me, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the, I might add, the, the, the magazine was a sellout on the campus. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, I had a, a cantankerous or uh, defiant attitude towards uh, uh, trying to tell a writer what to think and so forth. In that, I was an American, uh, and I thought that there was a real clash between uh, being an American and being a Catholic. Uh, and uh, and it, 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 I think a lot of people have come to agree with this. So, but Penn was a, for, a, a marvelous opportunity to join an organization that was going to fight censorship, and it was fighting censorship all around the world. And, and I think that's, to me, that's, that is the mission of Penn and that's I've always uh, even after I left the presidency and so forth I remained active on the freedom to write committee to me that free, uh, committee is the essence of Penn. And so uh, you know you you obviously joined Penn for, for censorship issues would you say that a lot of members that you encountered that you, that you met in your your years at Penn were they were they joining for similar reasons? Was there something that was, off, that was uniting everybody? I, I think that uh, most of the writers who joined Penn in my era, the 1970s, late 60s and 70s, uh, were looking for a, some feeling of community. I think writers, writing is a lonely job. And, uh, and at that, in that period, Penn was really consciously trying to provide a sense of community here in New York for writers. We had a weekly cocktail party at the Hotel Pierre. And we had conferences of one kind or another about the, the various subjects. And, <clears throat> but the, the, and then we had an annual dinner, as Penn still does, of course. Uh, and uh, but, so uh, th th this was very important, I think, to an awful lot of people, that they could come to some group, to, to, to be feeling they were part of a group where they could discuss their problems as writers in one way or another and just have the chance to talk to fellow writers in a neutral atmosphere. And it was, uh, it was really very uh, uh, important. And if I recall correctly, Penn had more than one, more than just an annual dinner. They had a couple of dinners in the course of the year. And uh, it, 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 all of that, I think, was, was one of the main motives. But <coughs> they, <coughs> excuse me, they soon, uh, uh, I think a lot of them did have the idea that it was important to fight censorship too. But uh, they soon got into the spirit of Penn, and, and we've never had any, in, never had any abil, uh, problem in, in, in getting people to support us when we went out to fight for a writer. Yes, sir. they'll have some amusing stories to that effect, but maybe, we'll, maybe we ought to wait for a little bit later in this. Uh, uh. No, go actually yeah. tell the stories. Yeah. Yes, well, 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 I remember one, one uh, there was a, there was a, a poet a, Cuba, a, a, a South Korean poet named Kim Chi Ha. He was the original troublemaking poet. And at that time, uh, South Korea was a military dictatorship. And this guy persisted in writing insulting poems describing the general who happened to be in command that year. And whammo, he'd be in jail, you know. And we'd, oh, you know, we'd be screaming and yelling. They were an ally of ours. So we thought we had more influence and so forth. So one day, he, uh, Kim Chi Ha got thrown in jail for the third or fourth time. So we decided we'd stage a big uh, uh, demonstration out at the, outside the UN. And we got some really good writers to stick with us, you know, on it. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut volunteered, for instance. So Kurt, as you can imagine, this big tall guy is out there, and he's got this uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, sign on on his chest, you know, uh, save Kim, uh, uh, save Kim Chi Ha, I believe it said, and uh, some lady came up to him and said, "I'll take one." <laughs> he thought she thought Kim Chi Ha was some kind of a product that, that he was giving away, <laughs> but that was just good for a laugh. But we 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 did really uh, go to the to the very top to try to save somebody. And we did keep him out of jail for, we got him out of jail, you know. We did have some influence with our allies at that time in the Cold War, you know. Uh, Penn uh, was uh, a, a voice that they paid some attention to. Um, well, you, you became president of, of Penn in 1970? 71, 71, I believe, yes, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about some of the important issues that were taking place then and some of the, some of the, the cases that you the uh, well, this was uh, the, the America was still the Vietnam War was raging, and 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 uh, so there was a great deal of uh, concern about people being censored for saying things against the Vietnam War, and we uh, very strongly intervened in that. But as far as I can recall, uh, uh, Penn itself did not take a formal position against the war. Now that may, uh, I will take responsibility for that. Uh, before I became president of Penn, I'd been president of the Society of Magazine Writers uh, in the 60s. And uh, th this was a, uh, a v very uh, a vocal organization, you can imagine, because they were writing day-to-day -day stuff. And they took, they, they, they had political opinions coming out their ears. Not that Penn didn't, but I mean, and they wanted the Society of Magazine Writers to take positions on all kinds of things. I remember Betty Friedan proposed when I was president of the Society of Magazine Writers that we take a vote and de denounce the Vietnam War. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea because I know a great many people in this organization don't denounce it. I don't. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, let's see, let's see. I, if, if we, uh, uh, what, what the, what, I, did, I, re I refused to put it to a vote. I said, let's, let me, let's take a, a non-binding vote to see what people think. And the meeting was divided almost half and half. And I said, uh, I think this shows that we shouldn't take a position. Uh, and, but Betty was relentless. And the, a, couple, a couple of years later, she, present, she presented this petition uh, to denounce the war every year for I guess two or three years, and as as the emotion built up over the war, uh, she did get a, uh, pen, the Society of Magazine Writers did finally vote that they were they opposed the war. But I took the position, <coughs> excuse me, that Penn was more effective if they didn't become part of this huge chorus that was building up to denounce the war. It was better for them to say, look, we're neutral on this, but this is censorship, and we will not tolerate it. And we wrote very strong letters to public officials denouncing the fact that uh, uh, that people were being arrested for saying outrageous things uh, not just about the Vietnam War but about uh, th this was the days of the, of the riots and uh, uh, cities were being burned and people were saying outrageous things about the whole structure of the United States and so forth and I, I remember one case that we really focused on was uh, uh, Amin Baraka uh, who, who, who uh, before he took that, uh, that name uh, was a uh, uh, Leroy Jones, and he, he was uh, in Newark, uh, and uh, he he uh, defended, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, burning down Newark or burning half of it down, and so forth. And he, whoa, they they really landed on him, and they they wanted to do something, try to put him in jail because uh, they argued that this is an incendiary situation, and so forth and so forth, uh, and. Uh, it, 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 it amuses me in retrospect now because I'm, I'm writing a book on the, the causes of the Civil War. And this was the very same thing that the South said about the abolitionists. They said, you're trying to start a race war and so forth. And they've had a gag rule in Congress and so forth and so forth. And so they tried to silence him. Oh, we made it. We launched a real campaign about that. And uh, when it was over, I got a really nice letter from him saying, you know, I couldn't believe you guys really did that for me, and I never, I'll never forget it. And it was, it was very rewarding to, to have that response. Right. Well, there are some of the other issues. I mean, is there, are, there, are there any other writers you want to talk about that you, for whose causes you would? You would no, nothing really uh, uh, springs to mind as in terms of uh, uh, names that uh, that were persecuted. Uh, it, 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 I don't recall, as a matter of fact, that writers were literally. Uh, 
persecuted by the government, the state or, or, or federal, uh, but it was <clears throat> an awful lot of uh, magazines and so forth were refusing to publish one uh, one view or not re or or or, or uh, and, and the opposite views. You know, there was a lot of local, I guess you'd call it, or, or subterranean censorship going on. But we did not get involved in that. We 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 were concerned with censorship as it was practiced by <coughs> uh, with with the with the force of the government behind it. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that that we noticed, we were, we've been going through some of the archive materials, and Larry gave me a, book, a binder on the on the 80s, on the 66 Congress. Yes. And we came across something uh, that was interesting. There was a write up uh, at the end of the Congress. Yes. Um, somebody uh, spoke up and asked Arthur Miller why Ginsburg, Lowell, um, Mailer weren't at the Congress, and he says, "Well, they're Penn isn't doing things that would interest them." Basically, the effect was that that they were out there protesting, they're out there involved, and that Penn was kind of more for, a, you know, settled, settled writers, you know, out for establishment causes. But it was a very, seems like a historic transition. We saw that Ginsburg was on the board yes. in the 70s, and it seems like Penn, you know, came off the sidelines more and more, you know, in the 60s and the 70s. Oh, it, it seems like there was a transition both both culturally and historic, but also within Penn. That, that's a very important question, and uh, I think I, I, I've had a, quite a few thoughts about that because I was sort of a witness of it. I, I joined Penn in the late 60s, I can't remember the exact year, but uh, again, I was immediately went on the Freedom to Write Committee, and that, that's what I was doing. But this was the era of Penn as an organization that was known as the Little Old Ladies in Tennis Shoes. Uh, it, it, we did not have a good reputation that nobody took Penn very seriously. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, a, a marvelous example of that uh, was uh, uh, we, we, we were basically sustained by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it was, I forget now, it sounds like chicken feed today, but it was seventy or $80,000 a year. And <clears throat> we had to go down, the president had to go down to Washington to appear before a board uh, of writers and other uh, people, cultural officials, to uh, make a, to, to argue for a renewal of the grant each year. Well, Tony Morrison happened to be on this board, <clears throat> and Tony was a good example of the kind of writers that weren't on pen, you know. And <clears throat> uh, she absolutely denounced pen. It wasn't she didn't make it a personal thing. She just said, "This is a ridiculous organization. It doesn't deserve any federal money. It's just a bunch of little old ladies in tennis shoes." She had the 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 quick. The, the slur down cold, you know, and <clears throat> so I did not get mad, did not lose my temper. I uh, calmly said, "I don't. I haven't. I've been a Pemmer Pen now for oh well, several years. And I haven't seen a single little old lady in tennis shoes." <laughs> and <clears throat> well, I really tried to take it lightly, you know. And I told the very important things we were doing, and <clears throat> the the grant was uh, issued. Uh, but with no problem whatsoever. And it, it, it's just to give an example, that's, I think it's a wonderful example of how writers can get carried away by an opinion. Uh, but it, as, I, as I already said, it wasn't personal. And about six months later, I was on a panel with Tony Morrison, I believe with the New York Public Library. And while we were waiting to go on, we chatted and she apparently did not associate me with that guy that, who came down from the Little Old Ladies and Tennis Shoes organization, you know. She, we, we got along wonderfully. I told her how much I liked her books and she, we discussed uh, what, to, you know, how you, what you think about before you write a novel and so forth. And, and uh, so it, it, was, it was an incident that uh, I, I think is worth remembering, that, uh, but it, it, it passed off uh, harmlessly, I think, mainly because I was able to deflect it pretty well. I did not look like a little old lady in tennis shoes, <laughs> but there were, a, in the 1960s and back into the 50s, Penn had got into a big decline, and it was really being run by a couple of uh, mostly women writers who did appreciate uh, the, uh, uh, shall we say, the, uh, uh, the importance of what Penn stood for, but they really weren't interested in getting out there and, and brawling with uh, people about uh, m making sure that this, this principle of no censorship was being obeyed and so forth. So, so it, it was, it was, this transition occurred very gradually, but pretty soon uh, these, these, these members, uh, Ginsburg, were, were in the, uh, 
I was in Penn, and I have a, a, tr a wonderful story about uh, Alan, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> one day, we had a little meeting, and uh, uh, we, uh, we asked Ed Koch to s speak to us about his book. We it had meetings to encourage authors, you know, to c come and talk about the book and so forth. So <clears throat> Ed came to our headquarters, and he was very flattered, of course, to be talking to a bunch of writers, he, a pal and all that. And <clears throat> so uh, uh, he gave a very nice and very amusing talk and so forth. And, uh, and then he said, uh, are, there, are there any questions? Alan puts up his hand and he says, when are you going to legalize pot in New York City? <laughs> and <clears throat> Ed just looked at him for a long minute. And then he said, Alan, you know what my answer to that is? Um. <laughs> and Alan, he shut him up, that's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but and, and another, after another meeting, I, I happened to be at the coat check, uh, check where we, and, I, and as Alan was putting on his coat and so forth. And I, I decided I'd kid him a little. And he, he was wearing a suit and so forth. And I said, Alan, you're looking more and more like a member of the establishment. <laughs> I can't get over it. Because when he first showed up, he didn't look like that at all. And he looked at me very haughtily and said, I've always been a member of the establishment. <laughs> I, I didn't take it too seriously. <laughs> well, that, you, you mentioned uh, some of the, the events that you had that you guys organized for writers. And one of them, I, I remember you mentioned the, that you guys that you brought uh, Pablo Neruda. Um, yes, well, this was the annual dinner. Yes, we, we, uh, I, I uh, as you can see from my preceding remarks, I, I was not afraid of controversy. In fact, I, I guess I kind of liked it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I decided to have big names, uh, from, but from abroad. You know, we, we hadn't had too many foreign writers speak. Uh, and we did have this big international conference, and that was uh, uh, a, a big visit of foreign writers. But for our annual dinner, we didn't have many. But I went out of my way to find some, and so I invited Pablo Neruda uh, for the, this uh, dinner. And uh, he, uh, I personally met him at the airport. He and, his, he and his wife got off the plane, uh, and of course, well, I guess perhaps it might be worth describing who Neruda was and so forth. He was a tremendously gifted poet uh, uh, from Chile, and uh, he was also very active politically, and he was a strong backer of the Communist Party in Chile. He was a communist himself. He'd been a, a diplomat for Chile for a previous couple of decades, I, I think, uh, at least for a decade. And he, he mixed in European politics. And this was the height of the Cold War, and, and people had violent and varying opinions. And he was a, a communist. And I remember thinking privately to myself, I didn't say a word to anybody, of course, but when I met him at the airport, his wife was wearing a mink coat that went all the way down to her uh, ankles. And I thought to myself, communism pays in Chile. <laughs> but that was, that was just nasty. I mean, and, and it, he couldn't have been more charming and he was very pleasant. And, uh, and he f frankly expressed as we drove in in the taxi that he was amazed that I had invited him and very flattered, of course. And his publisher was Farris Strauss and Giroux. And they were delighted too, of course. And uh, so uh, he, uh, he, he gave a reading at Columbia, and I, which I, to which I went, and he, he was marvelous as a reader. He was re his, English, his English was quite good. And he, he, he'd read this poem in Spanish, and then he'd read a translation. It was a sensation. And so <clears throat> everything looked great. And we went to the dinner. And we were up on a big dais at the Hotel Pierre. And he sat next to me, and uh, uh, and and <clears throat> before the the uh, the meeting began, the formal meeting began, and, and getting to his, to his speech and so forth, we had a, telegrams that people sent from various some pen centers from abroad sent us a telegram, and lo and behold, totally unsought and whatever, uh, Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon, sent us a telegram, and. Uh, uh, this was before Watergate, if I recall correctly. Uh, but at any rate, he still wasn't very popular with anybody in New York City. And so uh, I finished, I, I, I felt obligated to read the telegrams, which I did. And there was this huge boo, which filled the main dining room of the Hotel Pierre. And uh, I said, well, now that we've had our fun, we can go on with the program. Thank you very much. And I sat down next to Neruda. And I looked to him, at him, and he, his face was absolutely pale. 
he was terrified. And he, he looked at me and he said, will the police come? And he really thought that this might have been a trigger of some sort that we would have all been raided and then herded out into uh, police car, uh, into police vans or something like that. And I said, I laughed. I said, oh no, Mr. Ritter, don't worry about a thing. Just give us your talk. I know we're going to enjoy it. And he gave a wonderful, wonderful talk. It wasn't about the Communist Party line. It was about writing uh, poems and, and, uh, that, re that meant something to people and it, you didn't worry about uh, the, their impact politically if you thought it was a great poem. And uh, it, was, it was the perfect uh, speech uh, for them, uh, uh, for him. And uh, uh, it, the whole thing passed off as a, with salvos of applause and everybody was delighted that, that we had uh, invited them. A, a quick question. You said that you were, had a particular interest in writing and in inviting foreign writers. Yes. Why did you think that was important for Penn? Well, I thought that uh, Penn, uh, the American Penn, was in danger of not having enough contact with foreign Penn centers. and. Uh, uh, since I've gone, to, I had gone to uh, a couple of international conferences uh, before I became president. I realized what an important experience this was to have these these, these contacts with uh, with with these other Penn centers. And, and so, when I was president, uh, I always did my very best to get to be friendly with the, the prominent uh, uh, writers from these other centers. And, and and there was one case in which I. I'm very proud of the fact that I was very, I was, and I was going to say, well, a little self-congratulation won't hurt. I was very successful with one, I think, really great novelist, Heinrich Böll, the German novelist. Uh, and uh, this was, Germany was just emerging from the horrors of, uh, of, the rep, of, of the damage that Nazism had done to the reputation of all Germans. And... Uh, so they were very, they never said anything at Penn Centers or any, uh, at meetings, you know, in the international uh, uh, meetings. And, uh, but I thought Burl was a very, very impressive guy. Uh, he told me, just to give you a quick glimpse of how, uh, of how impressive he was, we, uh, we really got to be great friends. He told me very personal stories. And th this was the one that really got to me. <coughs> he was in East, Eastern Europe when the German army started to fall apart. It was 1945, the war was on its way to ending, and <clears throat> he saw that he was going to be taken prisoner any day, probably, and sent to Russia and no one would ever hear from him again. So he was at the, he'd been wounded twice, so he was a clerk in a back, a back of the lines uh, uh, headquarters of some sort. So he wrote himself out some orders to, to go back to Germany. And he had these orders, which he forged names on, uh, ge names of generals, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and he used these to get on various trains. If they ever caught him, they, he would have been taken off the train and shot. In fact, they did take a lot of people off several of the trains he was on and shoot them because they could see through their fake uh, ID, uh, IDs or whatever. Anyway, he, he finally got to Cologne, uh, his, his hometown, and he got off the train. And as he, w he hadn't seen his wife in, I guess, three and a half years or something like that. And as he got off the train, he was going down, the, it was an elevated platform where the train came in. He was going down the, the stairs, and who comes up the stairs from the other, on the other side but his wife? They see each other in the midpoint in those stairs. And he, talk, he was very religious. He, he, he said, I felt, that not for the first time, that God was telling me something that I had. Uh, and, uh, and he had this, uh, Beryl had this huge sense of international responsibility. He, he, he was horrified by the censorship in Russia, for instance. And uh, he, he, he felt something should be done about that. And it totally baffled us and Penn and everybody else. There, there was any, nothing you could do about it. These guys were being sent off by like Solzhenitsyn to, to, to Siberia and being thrown in prison and so forth. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, he, he, so he talked, he talked to me as somebody who would make a great international president. So uh, when we met in Lyon uh, 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 for uh, our international conference, uh, we had to propose an international, new international president, and uh, and I proposed him. The reaction of the French was not pretty. They 
absolutely blew their stacks and they well oh, they, they stopped the meeting no we had we can't decide this now we must discuss this and so forth and so forth and uh, so I then immediately met the challenge Penn in those days uh, was uh, again I just keep emphasizing the call for was a mini UN in, in the sense that a lot of the uh, members the delegations from uh, other countries particularly South America gravitated to the Americans and they wanted to find out what the Americans thought about this and that and uh, they generally followed our lead not that we pushed them around very much there wasn't the, they weren't that many issues that we would be issuing orders to them or anything like that but I knew a lot of these people and I was able to politic very very uh, assiduously for 24 hours with them uh, to convince them that this would be a wonderful thing for international peace that here we are saying yes Germany is back in the family of nations and we believe this we believe that they're trying to expiate the horrors and crimes of Nazism and here's our testimony we, we're, we're, we're electing this fine and he was already an international renowned, internationally renowned novelist uh, uh, and uh, it's very anti-Nazi I might add uh, uh, that uh, and so I, I just argued that it was a very good idea. So the next meeting, uh, the, fr the French, one of the French delegates stood up and he said, uh, I have a proposal to make. Uh, there will be no secret ballot for this meeting. Uh, there will be voice voting. Everyone will have to testify who they vote for. And then he glared around the room saying, does anybody here have the nerve to vote in public for a German? And I immediately protested and I said that is a ridiculous idea we've always voted by secret ballot why shouldn't we the Frenchman said a secret ballot is undemocratic <laughs> it shows the extremes to which people will be driven by political rage <laughs> and so that was voted down with a huge burst of laughter <laughs> and uh, uh, so we voted and Bo became president and here is a wonderful story I think that Penn can be very proud of uh, he, he was tremendously grateful. He understood the whole situation very, very much, uh, uh, and uh, all the ramifications of it. And what he did as international president is something that, n as far as I know, no other international president has ever done anything approaching it. He decided to go to Russia personally and travel through Russia and talk not just to the top people in Moscow, but to talk to mayors of cities and, 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 or, or, and politicians in, in small cities and so forth, and up to Leningrad and so forth. And he went in the middle of the winter with his wife. And I, I knew his wife very well too. And, uh, and she got pneumonia and had to go home in an ambulance car uh, on the train. And but he got to develop the horrible call. It was a Russian winter, you know, and it, it just it was, a, it was unbelievable. But he went all around and then he finally went to Moscow and talked to some top people there. And he said, I, I've talked to all your people. This is what he was why he was doing this. He, he, he's, I've talked to people all over Russia and they don't like this any more than I do. They don't think that you need to, to silence writers. Well, you're a great country. Why don't you just give writers the freedom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He got absolutely nowhere. Uh, but in the middle, he, uh, not in the middle, excuse me, at the end of this whole thing, he wrote me a wonderful letter. He was so upset that, uh, that he usually had uh, his, his uh, wife, Anne-Marie, or Anna-Marie, I think it was, uh, they, she usually tra uh, put his letters into English. Her, his, uh, her, her English was much better than his. And, but this time, he sat down, he had just gotten back, and... Uh, he said he'd been in bed for three or four days without running a big fever and so forth, but he just, he wanted to let me know. He felt so that we had this bond, you know, because I'd helped him become international president and so forth. He wanted to let me know what he tried to do and what, he was so heartbroken and so forth. And this letter, it, it was from a prose uh, point of view, you know, Anna Marie would have told him to burn it rather, rather than let it out of the house, but he just mailed it. And it was so, so touching. And I, I, I managed to get that published in a magazine. I, I improved it somewhat, the, the English and so forth. Uh, and it was a, a marvelous thing. And, and <clears throat> there was indeed a payoff. Uh, uh, a year or so later, 
the Russians kicked Solzhenitsyn out of the country. You know, they, they, uh, he'd been in Siberia, and then he got back, and he wasn't be he was misbehaving all over again. So they kicked him out of the country, and they gave him Burl's address. <laughs> that was the only thing. He, he had no money, nothing. He just had an address, Heinrich Burl, <laughs> and. As you can imagine, he was greeted with open arms and so forth and so forth and went on to have a great career as a, as a dissident from outside.